What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today, I said we'd do it, and uh, perhaps the show I've been looking forward to the most. And uh, we've got Crime Con coming up, so uh, an exciting week, a lot going on, but I'm glad we could make this happen. Uh, before we introduce you to our best guest, our best four-legged guest, uh, the end of a two-week manhunt for Pennsylvania fugitive Danilo Cavacante centered around a tactically trained canine named Yoda. The four-year-old Belgian Malinois is credited for bringing Danilo Cavacante, 34 years old, into custody as he attempted to crawl through underbrush, still armed with a rifle he stole from a garage. And when Cavacante refused to respond to officers' verbal commands, a Border Patrol team, a special team known as BORTAC, released Yoda to pursue him. And we all know what happened next. Yoda latched onto that leg, also to his head for a moment. And there in the background, you see Nate, who I'm about to introduce you to, our best guest today. Canine Nate and Houston police officer Paul Foster. Officer Foster, uh, you see there uh, with the hat on, he's a 16-year veteran of the Houston Police Department. Uh, a member of STS Nation recommended him. I reached out, and he said, got to get permission. I said, no problem. Um, I said, I've got Phil Waters on the show every Friday. Within 0.3 seconds, we got permission. So uh, Detective Phil Waters, I texted him right away. The guy's got pull, and uh, <laughs> this is thanks to – Thanks to Phil. So Officer Foster has been a handler in the uh, Houston Police Department canine detail since 2014. That would be nine years. Nate is his second SWAT slash patrol canine since becoming handler. Nate has been Officer Foster's partner for a little over three years, uh, and he's been extremely successful in locating and capturing numerous criminals and wanted fugitives and continues to be a huge asset making our community a much safer place. Um, not here yet, because he might be working right now. I was warned if he gets called off uh, to a scene, he might not be able to join right away. Uh, his name, uh, the officer's name is Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly. Uh, he's a patrol sergeant with the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Hillsborough, Oregon. Uh, he's a canine handler, and he supervises the canine team. Uh, he's worked for the Sheriff's Office in uh, Oregon for 19 years, uh, three years in the jail and the last 16 years in the patrol division. He's also a member of the SWAT team uh, since 2012. Uh, Radar is his first dog. He got him when he was a year old. He is a purebred Belgian Malinois. He is a single purpose apprehension dog. His specialty, believe it or not, is attics and crawl spaces because that's where he's good at finding people, but his primary role for Radar is tracking. Uh, last but not least, and uh, COE, keep an eye out on that email as well for uh, for Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly, just to make sure that uh, he's not trying to get a hold of us. Um, Charlie, in the bottom corner there, believe it or not, Cassidy is uh, an SGS Nation member. She found us by watching us and then wrote to me. I was super happy. Charlie, her dog, is a four-year-old German Shepherd from Kansas City. Uh, he's a certified live find search and rescue dog, part of the National Association, Association of Search and Rescue. Uh, he's going to be getting his second certification for human remains detection. Um, Charlie loves helping families, and he loves playing fetch. And right now he's being forced to sit there on Zoom, which he probably does not love. Cassidy. Uh, was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, forced to leave her family bakery business. She got this pup, Charlie, as a uh, gift, I believe, on Christmas and uh, decided to train Charlie. And uh, that is how all this came about. Um, so, Officer Foster, to you, um, you've been with your with, with Nate for, for how long again? So almost four years now. Four years. And. Do you truly consider him your partner um, the same way you would uh, another police officer in the force? Do you, are you are you two that tight right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you develop a bond. You know, never before I came to canine would I ever thought, hey, I can, you know, speak to an animal and, and him understand what I'm saying or him do something and me completely understand what's going on with him and what he needs. Um, 
so you develop a real close relationship with your dog because you're spending every day with your dog uh, in my line of work. You're you're going to work with him. You're coming home with him. You're you know you're throwing the ball at the house. He's he's part of the family, um, and you're just with each other 24 seven. So I'm with him. I tell my wife I'm with him more than I'm with her. I'm with uh, you know he's he's my my number one dude. Awesome. Um, no offense to the COE, but she knows I love being with dogs. Maybe, <laughs> maybe more than the uh, the COE is the chief of everything, uh, Officer Foster. And uh, Cassidy, to you, um, so tell us a little bit more. I just heard the story. Uh, sadly, you, you know, you got you got ill, and so you couldn't stay in the family business. But you sure. found you found Charlie, and what really prompted that decision to begin to train him? So first, I noticed Charlie was even as just a small puppy, like extremely easy for me to train. Then in um, 2020, oh, sorry, my husband's leaving. So Charlie's. It's all good. <laughs> we we never have, we um, never have an STS show without a dog barking. So it's all right? good, especially today. Okay, good. Well, we got that out of the way. Um, so in 2020, a little girl named Olivia went missing here in Kansas city and I wasn't working. Um, I, I don't know. I just felt like maybe there's something that I can do to help. And unfortunately, um, she was found um, deceased. But I, you know, just tried to keep her in the back of my mind and reached out to Kansas um, Canine Search and Rescue of Kansas based in Wichita. Um, and they just kind of took us in and trained us. We've also done um, some specialty training with Robert Nazisca at the National Canine Facility in New Mexico. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Officer Foster, back to you. So on uh, STS here, we were following, there was this case, and I don't know because you're you're a busy working uh, police officer, but there was a case out of uh, Pennsylvania. A fugitive was on the run for uh, two weeks. He escaped from a prison after murdering his girlfriend and being uh, convicted to prison uh, for life without parole. And it was this guy right here. Uh, let me just get rid of this comment. Uh, th these are the photos. This is Danilo Calvacante on the left wearing an Eagles uh, sweatshirt that he stole. And there in the middle circled is Yoda. Uh, he works for Bortac, which is the border uh, and customs protection dog. Uh, on the right, you see the uh, suspect being walked out after a medical check. Um, I know you weren't there, but, uh, what, how did, how did they utilize this dog? Cause they were sneaking up on him, uh, in the early morning hours when he was asleep. Um, is, is this how you would use Nate as well? Um, in a sort of a precarious situation, uh, he, they knew he was armed with a rifle and they unleashed him literally on this guy who, uh, obviously he got to and, uh, you know, latched onto that leg. But is this the type of situation you would use Nate in? Absolutely. We've used uh, Nate in numerous situations pretty similar to this. Uh, you know, they, they're a, a, a modified SWAT team. Uh, they, they, you know, they work just like we do uh, and, and utilize tactics the same as us. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with Bortac and uh, a great group of, group of guys. And, and, you know, their, their canines are top notch. Um, you know, Anytime the dog is utilized, the dog is utilized to search for a human odor. Um, so it's not like, you know, what a lot of people think. I, I was watching the news and it just drives me nuts. You know, you, everybody putting out their comments and, and, and uh, the, these news, news anchors thinking, you know, oh, we well, can just give a guy, give the dog the piece of clothing. Hey, go find this guy. And that's not how it works. Uh, these, these dogs that we have, they're uh, trained on odor, but it's trained on human odor. So all of us uh, sitting where we are, we're putting off human odor constantly. Uh, the longer you're in one space, the more odor you put out. And so these dogs will actually track that and they track ve fresh vegetation. Um, so you can, every time you take a step in the grass, they, you know, you break blades of grass, um, you mow your yard, you know, you have fresh grass smell. That's what the dog's smelling just amplified. Um, and so he can actually track through wooded area, um, through disturbed vegetation and, and actually pinpoint where the source of the odor is coming from. Uh, they're trained to engage the, the decoy is what we call them, the suspect uh as soon as they locate him so sounds like he did an outstanding job uh those guys are are professionals in every sense of the word um and uh you know it, it's it's not it's a very unnerving feeling going in after an armed suspect um you know we do it here in houston day in and day out um and you know these dogs are a great great asset 
uh, to our to our program and uh, are able to locate these suspects, you know, 15 times faster than what we ever could and a lot safer as well. Uh, you know, these armed suspects, as soon as they get bit, a lot of times lock up and they don't, you know, they just stop what they're doing. So, um, you know, there's situations where they don't, but, you know, in this situation, it worked, it worked out great. The dog sounds like he got a great leg bite, which uh, allowed these guys to put him in custody pretty quickly. Uh, well put. Uh, it's starting already. We've got a lot of women in STS Nation. Cute dogs and cute officer Paul, too. He's married, so uh, back off, <laughs> ladies. We'll have to uh, let the dogs loose. Um, but you bring up a good point, and this would be so hard for me because I'm an absolute huge dog lover. Um, in this particular situation, Officer Foster, you know that this guy has just stolen a rifle, and he's murdered two people, one in Brazil, and he's murdered one uh, in the United States, and it was his girlfriend, and he stabbed her 38 times in front of her children. So you know this guy is a bit of a loony uh, tune, you know, kind of dude, and will you know can become unhinged. How 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 nerve wracking is it for you when you know there's an armed suspect, but you got to let Nate loose and know that Nate is potentially in the line of fire? Yeah, I mean, you know, so. Uh... These dogs are tool are great tools. Like I said, that you know, he's my partner. I love this dog, you know, more than, you know, I love that my wife's dog, little dog at home. You know, it's just like we develop a bond with one another. So you never want to send your dog into into a losing situation. So we take every um, opportunity to to gain the upper hand, uh, just like these border attack guys were doing, using drones, using uh, any you know fleers. I'm sure infrared, every, anything they could do to to get the upper hand. Uh, they were going to use, you know, and it just, it comes down to, you know, if somebody's dedicated, we have to use a canine. I, I can, as sad as it, sad as it, sad as it is, I can replace Nate tomorrow. Uh, if he gets shot in the line of duty, killed in the line of duty, I, I can replace him with a new dog that will do the same job that he does. However, I can never replace another human life. I can never replace another officer who's, who's working right along beside me. Um, so you really have to take it in perspective. And um, as a handler, you kind of have to put that in the back of your mind. Uh, you don't ever want anything to happen to your dog. Uh, Nate was stabbed in 2022, uh, almost lost his life, took 12 inches of a, of a butcher blade to his chest and um, almost died. Never in a million years would I put him in that situation, but he saved an officer's life that day. Um, I can, you know, if Nate was to lose his life that day, it would be traumatic for me. It'd be, it'd be very hard to deal with, but uh, it'd be much harder to deal with uh, talking to that officer's family and explaining why he's not no longer with us. Wow. Uh, so you said it was 2022 and he was stabbed. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit more about that story? What was uh, yeah, what were you called out to? What was the scene? So we went out for a uh, uh, basically a robbery in progress. There's a male that was trying to uh, attempted to carjack some people. Um, officers see him. They get into a foot chase, pretty substantial foot chase. Um, they lose him at one point in an apartment complex and he pops up again and, and takes off down the road. Well, as I was arriving to the scene, I see this, this guy's little scrawny guy uh, running down the street, wearing a hoodie and some shorts and, you know, nothing in his hands. Uh, and I was thinking, Oh man, this is going to be an easy one. You know, this is, I've, I've had ones that are a lot tougher than this. Mm. And uh, he runs right in front of our vehicle and runs into a backyard. I, I park and deployed canine Nate. And, uh, we go approach the fence and I'm thinking, okay, there's like six officers behind this guy. Somebody's bound to catch him. He's in a tiny backyard. Uh, the yard had a, a detached garage in the back and the guy was pretty much circling the detached garage, trying to stay away, attempting to get over this, this pretty tall 12 to 14 foot tall fence. Well, he disappears behind this, this garage and they had been chasing him in the backyard for probably two, three minutes. Um, so an officer was about to you know, moving towards the corner of the, of the garage, uh, to, to go back there and go ahead and grab the suspect. He had nowhere to go. Um, I told the officer to stop threw Nate over the fence. Nate hit the ground running, took off after the suspect. And when he rounded the corner, I heard a, a screech and uh, knew something wasn't right. Cause uh, you know, either Nate didn't, it doesn't ever sound like that. And I could definitely tell it was Nate come around the corner. Um, and weapon pointed at the suspect. And as I'm slicing the corner, I catch out of my left eye. The suspect's coming up with a knife and about to come down on the suspect. And he looks, uh, come down on Nate and he looks at me, uh, start to give a good squeeze of the trigger. And guess what he did? 
didn't want to have anything to do with it through the knife. Uh, I went ahead and started giving him commands. I could immediately see arterial spray from Nate's chest. What happened was, is as Nate's coming around the corner, uh, su the suspect took a good uppercut with the knife into Nate's chest. Uh, it hit the left breastplate, uh, center punched him, went underneath his, luckily it bounced off against his chest plate and went underneath his left arm, severed seven arteries, uh, severed his chest muscle. Um, he lost a substantial amount of blood. Um, called Nate back to me. Uh, he, he was just had come off the arm bite. He had actually made contact with the suspects under arm. Uh, called Nate back. He staggers back. I go ahead and grab him. I still got an armed suspect in front of me. Uh, suspect complies, you know, puts up his hands. I start telling him, communicating with the guys, hey, we got a knife on the ground. We got the suspect. You know, he's, he's compliant. They went ahead and put hands on with him, and I carried Nate back to the, uh, to the car. Uh, as soon as I put my hand over his chest, I could immediately feel arterial spray. Um, luckily, I was, you know, blessed to have uh, – Excellent medical training for canines um, that the department put us through, uh, through Life Flight, uh, which is our medical helicopter here in Houston. Those guys are amazing and put us through an outstanding class. I was able to, to even though in a time of stress, I was able to rec recognize what I needed to do when I needed to do it. Um, I was to, to, you were going back to how we feel, you know, when, if anything happens to our dogs, I was in a state of panic and shock at the time, right? I, I picked Nate up. Uh, in fact, uh, as I'm going back to the car, I slipped in Nate's blood that had sprayed on the ground and slammed my head into the, the passenger side wow. of this lady's car. Wow. I probably had a good concussion. Uh, probably should have gone to the hospital. Uh, went out to the car about, that was like 35, 40 yards off. I was able to pack his wound, um, slow down some of the bleeding. It was like turning on a water faucet and then packing it and turning it maybe, you know, half off. Um, I threw him in the back of the car and, uh, it was go time. We had, I it took me about six minutes. I was, you know, six minutes to get into the hospital. I called the hospital ahead of time, let him know he was coming. Um, and they were able to do Vergy animal hospital was able to do blood transfusions and, you know, work their magic. They had him in surgery probably within 10 minutes, uh, which, you know, saved his life. He just, it, it, it was amazing. It was like all the stars aligned for us to, you know, for him to be with us today, it was, it, it just, I can't say anything else other than that. It was just, uh, uh, you know, right place, right time. Um, so it, it really was, you know, one of those things where it's just, it's shocking and, uh, it, it was hard to deal with at the time. And, and, you know, uh, you never want anything like that to happen to your dog, uh, your partner. Uh, but you know, it, it worked out and, uh, he came back to work a month later, which was surprised everybody. Um, so yeah, and then we got, then then he got shot at, and we got into another situation, and uh, we got uh, put on rest for another month, which we needed, <laughs> and uh, we were on rest for another month. I swam him, and and we ran on the exercise machine that you'll see in video in a little bit, and uh, you know we strengthened him, strengthened him back up, and uh, it was much needed because he came back 110 percent. Wow. Hoku Totube says this guy's a badass. I can tell. I know he loves his dogs. The dogs are badass too. Um, that's unbelievable. So uh, obviously, Cassie, I meant to come to you sooner, but this story just threw me for a loop here. So I got some follow-up questions. I mean, if this was a fellow um, human officer, uh, you guys would all be surrounding uh, this officer going to the hospital. What was the reaction from the Houston PD when he was stabbed? What? Uh, what do the human officers do in response to that? Is he given some sort of medal? Yeah. Yeah. So he was recognized. Um, he, he, I got a life-saving award for it and he got, uh, he got a commendation as well. So he was recognized by the department. Um, I think we have some pictures up on our Instagram page of us actually being recognized by the chief of police, uh, Troy Finner. And, uh, you know, it, it was, the support was great. Uh, we were in the hospital for probably three or four days. Uh, we had an, overwhelming amount of officers come and check on us and, and, and make sure we were okay. Uh, you know, we had, uh, the mayor of the surrounding towns, uh, come in to give us lunch and, you know, take care of us. And, you know, I slept on the ground right next to him, uh, while we were there until they kicked us out. Uh, they, uh, he was chewing, ended up chewing up, you know, three days, three, four days later, he ended up chewing up IVs from the like, dogs next to him. So they're like, okay, time to go. He can heal at home. Like, you know, it's, he's good. Uh, and does this go all the way up? To, I mean, does the chief weigh in on this? The chief of the Houston PD that he obviously has to know about this. Does he give you a call to see how Nate is doing since he is? Oh, a abso 
absolutely. We're, we're a close family here in Houston. Um, from the top down, uh, I had, we, you know, we have numerous chiefs here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, chief Fenner called me personally, checked on me, made sure everything was okay with Nate. I had, uh, you know, numerous assistant chiefs calling me, checking on me, stopping by the house. Uh, you know, so it, the, just the, the camaraderie and the, uh, the love and support that these guys gave was, was very, very great, great because I mean, you know, you take, even as you know, me, it's like something happened to, to, to me. It's like, they treat these dogs as, uh, officers and, you know, they're just a part uh, of our, uh, our department just as much as I am. So, um, these guys are really loved the, uh, the patrol guys we work with, they all, you know, we work with the same guys day in, day out. They all care for Nate and, uh, they all know him, you know, the SWAT team, it's Nate is their dog. Uh, uh, you know, it, he's just as much mine as he is theirs. So these, these guys all love him. Well, wow. and when he was, uh, when he was shot at, uh, he wasn't hit, I take it, but he had a, no, no, it's uh video's actually on YouTube. So, uh, it's been released now, but, uh, you know, it, it, he wasn't hit. Uh, I sent Nate after a, a carjacker. Uh, he got about probably 35 yards down the road. The guy turned around and started shooting at us, uh, by the grace of God, neither one of us were struck. Um, and, uh, and the suspect's no longer with us. So. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that we, we put these dogs in situations like this to keep us safe, to keep the community safe. And they do an outstanding job. Um, they, they really are, you know, amazing, amazing assets to our department. Um, there's been numerous instances where, where Nate saved me, um, my previous dog T-Rex, same thing. Um, these dogs really, really are, are just a huge part of our department. And I want to circle back and hear a story about how uh, Nate did save you. But let let me get over to Cassidy for a minute. So uh, Lori Clarkson writes, and uh, um, Officer Foster just talked about this. I've heard of differences between bloodhounds and German shepherds and Belgian Malinois. What are the differences as trackers? So Cassidy, tell me a little bit more about um, what Charlie does and you know what Officer Foster was just saying that the minute this fugitive went missing, we did get a lot of comments saying, how come they can't just track this? How come they can't let the bloodhounds out um, and get this guy? And they were, you know, they were impatient with law enforcement, by the way. Uh, but explain a little bit about how the tracking side of this works, if you can. Sure, of course. Um, so a lot of times, I think in the media, the term bloodhound is used now to really just describe any kind of trailing or tracking dog. Um, I know on our search and rescue team, we do we don't have any like actual bloodhounds. <laughs> They're oh. all shepherds or labs. Um, I think the difference between the three breeds is temperament and drive. Um, it's probably just situational depending <clears throat> on the dog um, as far as what the handler or trainer is looking to do with him. Um, as far as why they didn't send the dogs in right away, um, I mean, do we know that they didn't for sure? We, I don't we, know. Um, we don't know, but I did speak to someone um, because they, they at first they didn't have anything to like run a scent off of. Um, and oh, OK. So, yeah. Um, well, once like, it once once it went a few days and he left some clothing behind, I think then they started to try to track him. Right. Uh, so not all dogs require a scent article. Uh, Charlie is trained um, to find any human odor. So if there is, you know, a giant wooded area like he was probably in, they wouldn't necessarily need um, his scent article if the dog is trained to find any human odor. However, that could be problematic um, if the dog is, you know, also apprehending someone and if it's trained to just find any human odor you know how do you know it's the right one so you're right they probably were waiting until they got some of his um, clothing articles for the dog to use um, just to make sure that they had the right you know person so if I can step in the so mm -hmm. it's all about tactical advantage here um, when we deploy on suspects like this uh, you're going to use a, every available asset prior to the deployment of the canine. The canine is not the first tool you throw out there and use. Um, you're gonna have drones, you're gonna have robots, you're gonna have other uh, aircraft and, and, and things like this. So 
the search is going to be slow, very, very slow. And uh, everything you do is going to be uh, very methodical and, and just very, very slow. We have a lot of patience when it comes to this, especially, I mean, they, th you know, I have a feeling they knew exactly he was, that he was inside of their perimeter. Um, you know, that's what led them there. Uh, you're not going to move fast in this situation, especially if he's armed with a gun. Last thing we want is him taking out another casualty, uh, especially law enforcement, you know, when, when we have, we can have the upper hand and we can have the advantage by putting our tools to work and slowing down. And, you know, I understand like, you know, media and, and, and dis dis community gets impatient with the way we, we work and the way we do things. I mean, we are on SWAT scenes that can last, you know, nine hours, 12 hours. And the guy's in a house where we know he, he's there. Um, so we're going to use every available asset first before just sending the dog in. Uh, you'll see, you know, you can go to, to police activities, you know, YouTube page and look up tons of tragic videos that will involve canines. And, you know, a lot of the time, the reason the canines get injured or killed is because they rush, they, they push. And, you know, as law enforcement, we have to tell ourselves and we have to train in, in it to slow it down and to start to uh, methodically clearing and methodically searching and do it, do it the safer way. We have technology, which is amazing. Uh, it makes our job a lot easier and it's a lot safer for the dog. Um, so, you know, going back to, I guarantee this dog is not a, a scent driven dog as far as, you know, where he's a bloodhound. Bloodhounds are typically what you think of as, as a bloodhound where you give him a scent article and he's able to distinguish that article from any other article. Uh, you can give him my shirt and he'll, you know, I can go four days later and hide somewhere and he's going to find me because he has that scent recollection. Uh, these dogs are not that way. This dog, uh, Yoda, is not that way. I can I can 100% guarantee that. He's he's based off, he's trained off human, human scent, human odor. And in order to find human odor, you have to have the presence of human odor. So if this guy, they have to know exactly where this guy was, where he walked through the woods, where he made, uh, you know, in order to actually track the suspect. Um, so they're usually most likely using him as an air scout in this situation, which means the guy's sitting there in one, in one area. And like I said earlier, he's putting off a ton of odor. He's filling up, uh, filling up the, the, the area pretty well with his odor. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll get downwind of that. Uh, the dog can scout that odor and you can pretty much nail, uh, from, you know, two, 300 yards off that the, where the suspect is, uh, in relationship to where the wind's blowing. Uh, so there's a lot of different tactics we can use, but we're definitely not going to just throw a dog down. Uh, the dog's going to be, uh, he's going to come in later. Uh, when we, when we know we're a little, you know, probably technology confirmed him, I'm sure technology confirmed him or, uh, they had maybe a clue of, of where this guy was. Uh, they didn't just go in there blind. Um, so if they got close enough, the dog most likely picked up on the source of odor, was able to track to them and, and engage him, uh, with the team pretty close by. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually we'll long line the dog um, in this situation. They may have been working off leash. I can't, you know, I know I would have been working off leash being the guy had a rifle um, and we're in a confined area such as the woods. No normal person is going to be probably hiding in the woods. Uh, so you could probably safe to bet only the suspects in there uh, and you're in there probably very com comfortable with working their dog off leash. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into this. It is not, it is not simple. It's taken me years to develop uh, the ability to work a dog in this kind of environment and in a tactical environment. It's not the same as what you see on the street in, as a patrol dog. Um, Yoda has been through, I guarantee you, a lot more training than the average patrol dog, just the same as Nate. Um, so it, it's, it really is um, a different world working a tactical dog. Wow. And you see how important they are. Um, it really is amazing. Again, that is a shot of Yoda up there who uh, nabbed uh, the fugitive uh, out of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Danilo Calvacante, who was on the run uh, for two weeks. Thanks to Yoda. Uh, they got that guy. Um, I did Google this and uh, dogs have 225 million scent receptors uh, in their noses. A human has 5 million. So 225 million compared to 5 million. I once heard the analogy, uh, you know, a human being smells a pizza, but the dog smells every item on that pizza separately, the cheese, the tomato sauce, the mushrooms, all those things completely separately. This is an interesting question. Uh, just 
Officer Foster, back to you in light of what happened. Do the dogs get therapy for injuries, trauma? Do they get anxiety after big events like the one he went through? Uh, so it depends on the dog. Uh, depends on their drive. Uh, these dogs all have a natural drive, natural hunt drive. And, uh, you know, it, it really depends on the dog. So I'll tell you, I have two different dogs right, right now that live in my house, two police dogs. Uh, one is a retired police dog. His name's T-Rex. He had uh, a bone cancer, a very deadly form of bone cancer in his leg. They gave him a year to live, amputated his leg, uh, and it saved his life. He's now been with me six years, and he's not doesn't seem like he's going anywhere right now. Uh, but he developed anxiety because of losing his leg. I had to have him on anxiety medication. I had to work with him and, and kind of, you know, develop that, um, you know, self-esteem and courage, you know, to, to keep on going. Uh, and you really notice the anxiety in him. Nate, however, had zero anxiety, had zero, it didn't bother him. Uh, I could have taken him out the, uh, the next day and he would have wanted to, to do his job. It, it really had no effect on him. Um, in fact, we, in order to bring him back to work a month later, we developed, we did a bunch of tests on him, uh, which were what we call courage tests, which is where, uh, you know, basically re-simulate the event. Uh, you know, we have the strike sticks, which are like rubber strike sticks that you, you know, you decoy with them and, uh, hit it at him and, and see if the dog, if you can get the dog to, to false and come off. And, um, uh, you know, Nate had no issues. He had no issues going in the, you know, and, and finding people in houses. And, and, you know, uh, it was not even a couple of days later, we were getting into a car chase and, and he was going after another suspect. So it, it, it just, it, each individual dog is different. Um, I don't believe that they're, they're going to go through that like a therapy, um, as far as like what we would go through, what I probably, you know, should have gone through, I guess, uh, you know, it, but they definitely have, we do have to put them through the, 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 the paces mentally. And then, you know, of course, physically, right. You know, an injury is not, you know, think about a sports athlete. These guys are, are athletes. Uh, you know, a sports athlete who tears his pec muscle or, or gets stabbed probably going to take a while, some time to come off and, uh, and get back. But, you know, we, we worked with him that you did this every day, um, you know, just to encourage him to, to, to run. This was actually pretty close after to, to when he was stabbed. Um, and you can tell he's got a limp there in that left leg. Uh, and so swimming him, you know, running him, playing ball with him, strengthening him up physically, as long as we can get him there physically, he was good to go. And, uh, Shaquille O'Meal, the best name in all of YouTube. He said he wants to see how these dogs are trained. You're looking at a video, Instagram video of start of officer Foster and his, uh, canine, uh, Nate right there in action. W what are you doing with the, uh, the little chew toy there? Is that to keep them so, on a focus? Yeah, so we, or what? we basically train these dogs are like, like I said, they're driven to, to, to work, right They're but they're driven for a toy. Everything's fun for this dog. We make the, we make everything we do into a game, uh, whether it's biting a suspect, it's a game. They're not angry with the suspect. They're wagging their tail. They're having a grand time, but it's a game. We've made it into a game. So you see me here with the tug. I'm making what we're doing right now into a game to get him to actually do what I want him to do, which is exercise. So I make it fun for him. He enjoys it. He likes it. And, uh, and, and we do that, you know, and I, he's got this Kong that he's got in his mouth, this thing, he lives, lives or dies for this thing right here. So I mean, <laughs> he, uh, he, you know, he'll do anything for it, but you, we, you know, we train them so that, you know, I may not have a decoy, somebody in a, in a bite suit in front of me, but if I can have this tug or if I can have that Kong, and I can perform the same actions with those two things, with those two articles, then I can train him to do anything I want on a, on a suspect or a decoy. So we play a game regularly where we take the Kong, I get him into a heel and I throw it. I tell send Nate on it as I would a suspect. As soon as, you know, I, he gets very, very close. I'll, I'll call him off of it. I'll down him right in front of it. I'll recall him back to me. Now, how this works is we do this two or three times a day of big, you know, fun sessions. And when it comes to putting somebody in a suit or put it or having a suspect, it just it goes rolls right over. And I can send him on a suspect. I can down him at their feet. I can recall him, and you know, he'll never touch him. Um. So, Cassie, to you, uh, by the way, Jacqueline says I like how calm and loving Charlie is, and been a little heavy on uh, the Nate side, but after that story, oh, that's him okay. getting stabbed. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm a regular fan. So I'm just like, 
Oh, please tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you are here. So yes. I have so many questions. I asked STS Nation to write in, and we haven't even gotten to pretty much any of them. But um, how does Charlie know kind of the difference between work and play? Um, how do you delineate that for him? For him, because he is um, also my pet, which is a major, major, major difference between him and these badass officer dogs <laughs> he's a little more soft <laughs> but um we have rituals so you know he gets a harness that is only for his when he's going out on a search or practicing um he has a certain toy that is his uh reward for um that one specific job that's his favorite toy and that is the only time he gets it or the only time he sees it um you know, he has his uh, his search commands that are all different for each job that I'm asking him to do. Um, yeah. He it's just mainly each ritual helps him kind of know like, oh, hey, we're going to go out and work now. Even down to I use a different leash. If and t and Tell us what we're looking at now, because this is some training video of Charlie. What's he doing? Um, here? Yeah, sure. Here I was just working on some basic obedience with him. Um, it's important for him to, you know, be well behaved out there and, uh, trust, um, is really important. You have to trust your dog. Um, so just working obedience with him, um, you know, quite often helps us with that. He, um, he is just great. And then, um, also the and, sit and right and here, yeah, this here with a sit mm -hmm. and stay, <laughs> How, what are you doing that's making him sit and then stay sitting? Is it just hand commands right at this point? Uh, so he has a verbal and a hand command. Uh, it's a combination for each uh, sit and down. Um, that way, if, you know, um, I'm out of his eyesight, he still can hear it and perform the command, especially if we're, you know, out in the wilderness doing a search, it's important that he, if I tell him to stop, he stops because we don't want him to get hurt uh, while we're out there. Such good, such a good boy here. Um, yeah, he is. To you, uh, Officer Foster, someone just asked and said, uh, I hope that uh, these dogs yep. wear uh, jackets, you know. So here we go. Ready. All right. There. Okay, there so are. this right here is, is bulletproof. It's stab proof. Uh, stab resistant. It's a canine made by Canine Storm. Uh, they're very, very pricey. Uh, they're priced around like thirty five hundred bucks each. Mm. Uh, we have a great organization um, that has donated uh, to our entire unit. Uh, we have actually two uh, Canines of Valor uh, and Christina Roof, uh, who runs, who helps run that program. Um, they're a nonprofit, and they donate these vests uh, to agencies all across the United States. Christina really, really cares about, um, you know, canines and the police dogs. And so she's donated this vest to Nate. We started off with Nate and then we've now vested our entire detail. Um, and then we have our Houston police foundation that, that assisted with, uh, canines of valor to, to supply us those. So they are, um, they, they're amazing. You know, before Nate got stabbed, we did not have them. Um, I had a, a vest that weighed about 13 and a half pounds that we would throw in on a SWAT scene. Um, it's a hundred degrees here in Houston, 105. I think it was 110 like last week. So, uh, you can imagine wearing a 13 pound vest on a dog and trying to track or do anything with him. it. You know, you're at risk for a lot of different things like heat stroke and, and they just don't work as long. Um, and so it's not practical. So, uh, before he was, st he was stabbed, we were wearing a soft body armor and then, uh, we were upgraded to these and these have definitely come in handy. Um, I know there's been dogs across the United States wearing these and, you know, one's fallen off of a, a of a second floor and hit rebar and, and survived. And um, I mean, there's there's all kinds of good deals that come from this vest. So, yes, Nate doesn't go. He doesn't leave home, home without it now. Hmm. Uh, Tali in Israel watching us from Israel. I wouldn't want to try to break into one of these handlers homes. That would probably not be a good idea for a number of reasons, because I have a feeling Officer Foster's got a couple of weapons in addition to uh canine nate but uh, i was just going to ask you this officer foster Lori clarkson uh do you speak to him in german seriously i've heard military dogs are trained in german commands i do know because i was once a reporter near an air force base that 
um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but w sort of wherever the dog is being brought over from, because uh, I've heard commands in Czechoslovakian too. Yeah. Um, is this common to give commands in foreign languages? Off yeah, foreign absolutely. Uh, you know, we get these dogs in, they come from, you know, they spend about a year. We usually get them around 11 to 14 months. Uh, just so you know, and they, and they come, so they come over with, with some basic commands sometimes. Uh, most of the time we, we're, we get green dogs that have no, ab, no obedience. They just know the attack command. That's why a lot of, a lot of times our bite command is given in, um, you know, German or Dutch, or we have one dog in French. Um, so that's why those, a lot of those languages are spoken to the dogs is because we get them from overseas reason we get them from overseas and not here in the United States is because breeding requirements uh, overseas are a lot stricter and it, you know, health issues with pure blood bloodlines are a lot better over there than over here. So um, that's why we purchase our dogs from over overseas. And then, you know, a vendor will actually sell them to us here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the language just is just where they come from. It's, there's nothing special. It's not, Hey, the suspect can't, doesn't know the commands. You could, my dog, most of his commands are in English because T-Rex was in, in three or four different languages. And so I picked the easiest ones to remember from him, which are all in English and kind of ran with it with this dog. He was green with it when I got him. Uh, pretty much the only uh, only commands that, that he has in a different language are his out command and his bite command. Everything else is in English. And I did, I've done that because we operate on the SWAT team where any one of the members on the SWAT team can operate Nate. So if I go down, they can pull the dog off, um, you know, simply by, by telling him to, to let go. Uh, they can manipulate him and, and point him to in the direction of the suspect and give the command to, to apprehend the suspect, or they can, you know, tell him to search or tell him to, you know, to do different things. So there's a lot of different things that are in a basic language that we teach these SWAT operators because one, the SWAT operators are not canine handlers and they don't really care to be. So teaching them in the simplest form and, uh, and then, and then teaching them how to do my job, uh, it, it makes it, it, it for us, it's a big advantage because I don't have to be in the front of the stack. These guys can operate me and the dog from the rear and still get the dog to do what they want, want him to do. And, and Cassie, do you, um, I assume the training is constant. So are you, are you out with Charlie every day? Is it, I mean, it's, it's, you're never done training. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. We always, you know, you try to keep up on it. Um, I train with Charlie. I try to do a couple hours a day, um, a couple different search problems for him or obedience. Uh, but daily is important. Um, Moto says here, do you volunteer officer foster to take on a police dog or are you assigned this job? Uh, must you take the assignment? Do you get a lot of training? Did you wave your hand and say, Hey, let me have uh, Nate. Were you, was this a volunteer uh, option on your part? Yeah. So it's different everywhere, every department you go to, whether it's big or small. Um, we are in a massive department uh, here in Houston. I mean, you know, we're the, I think the third largest city in the United States. Uh, we have a, a massive uh, group of officers here that work here. And so, you know, they put out a, a circular and, and it's like kind of like a job application. You have to apply for it. You have to uh, do a physical fitness test. You have to, you know, um, be picked and selected for this position. So, you know, I did eight years on patrol and then came over to the canine detail. It was my third time applying uh, to, to finally get in. And uh, I was finally accepted and then ran from there. So I've been doing this since uh, the very beginning of 2014. And um, it's just been, you know, a downhill slope from there. Hmm. I'll, I'll be retiring where I am. Yeah. Awesome. That's that's amazing. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you might get yourself in trouble because I'm going to ask you about it, that uh, that canine uh, Nate saved your life. Can you tell us uh, when that was? What happened? What were the circumstances? I mean, he's done it more than once. He, you know, he, we've located suspects that uh, in walls. We've located suspects that that are in bushes waiting on ambush. Uh, you know, throughout Nate's career, he's located probably over 150 different suspects uh, just in the about three and a half years that he's been working the streets. Um, T Rex before that was probably close to in his career, probably close to 500 suspects. So, I mean, these, these dogs get a lot of work here in Houston. Um, I would say they get probably the most work in the United States. Um, I know Florida is probably pretty close because I watch their videos on YouTube all the time. Um, so, I mean, you know, we get a lot of work. We put down a lot, uh, probably a good, you know, three to four times a day. We're out searching each individual canine handlers out searching for a suspect. 
and I'm probably doing, you know, in, anywhere between five and 15 SWAT operations during the week. So, uh, you know, these dogs get used countlessly. Um, we're always working very rarely home. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a nonstop. Does he have a, like a switch? Like when you get into the patrol car and he goes into his cage, does he know that, or the kennel, does he know that now it's work time? Does it's more he, environmental. I could turn him on right here. And, and, you know, if there was someone here, I could get him to do his job. Um, it, is that on a command? How would that work? Let's, let's say just, someone, so let's say so, someone broke in right now. What, what would you do? Would you give him a command? So let me, let me, t- okay. So when you, when you're driving home, right. And you exit your freeway. Okay. You know, you're going home. Yeah. Okay. So, so does the dog. <laughs> I can exit the freeway and he's like, Oh, I know I'm going home. So yeah. how, how can he, he can do that. And then, you know, but he does, he, he works, you know, a lot more than he does just come home. Right. So if he can work, you know, 10 hours a day, he recognizes very easily when he's working and when he's not working. So if I throw him in the car, does he turn into work mode? No, he, it, it's all environmental. It's all, you know, it, it could be like, Hey, the sirens coming on. Hey, dad's driving faster than normal. Hey, mm-hmm. there's a bunch of police officers outside. As soon as he gets out the car and he sees his fellow brothers and sisters, he's, he's game time. Like he's ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, he knows what his job is. He knows what he's doing. Cause I could switch him from that and have him go search for guns and he's light switch. You know, it, it there literally is a light switch. Uh, I could put him with it with a SWAT team with seven guys in front of us. And he knows that light switch. He knows what to do. He's not, you know, these dogs are in, incredibly smart They're They're, um, and you do it enough. You rep, you know, we, I'm training probably four hours out of every day. Uh, we're training. So, I mean, you could imagine putting these dogs in the scenarios that, you know, I would never put him in something that he hasn't done. Right. So we pretty much train for everything. So they, they start recognizing what scenarios you're putting him in. They start, you know, Hey, is this just a, what am I doing here? Am I searching for a gun? Am I searching for an explosive or, or we're searching for a person instinctively knows. I don't have to tell him a different command. His commands the same for every single thing he does. Now, some handlers do it differently. Some handlers have a specific command for, you know, one thing and then a different command for another thing. And then, you know, it, it, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Right. Hmm. Um, I've been doing this long enough where Nate's actually my third dog. Um, so each dog was different, right? Uh, T-Rex needed a command for search for like finding a person. And then he needed a separate command for hunting a gun or a separate command for hunting a, a explosive. So he was one of those dogs you'd really had to to give him those separate entities and tell him, Hey, there's a difference between searching outside in a yard or, and there's a difference between searching inside of a building. Here's what I want you to do. And here's the command for it. Right. He was that way. Nate search dogs doing whatever I need him to do. And I don't have to tell him any different. By the way, that suspect uh, who stabbed Nate, um, is he charged with attempted homicide on an officer? Cause no, unfortunately, uh, the law is different in every state and in Texas, oh, these they dogs need to are, fix that in Texas. I, agree, I would I expect agree. that. Well, these dogs are treated just like property. So, you know, if you, if you kill Nate, you know, you're charged with, you know, animal cruelty, injury to service, poli- a police dog. It's not, not the same as killing me, not the same as killing my fellow brothers and sisters, uh, which is a shame, right? Because they do the same exact jo- job. They work right alongside um, everybody. And, and, you know, there's no difference in my mind. Um, you know, and, and it's just unfortunate. They need to change that. Tell us what we're looking at here. So we're doing an area search. Uh, so I have a, another handler uh, hiding inside of that boat right there. And I'm basically just showing how odor works, right? So we had a pretty good, a strong headwind towards that fence. So he's basically following the wind back to the fence, giving me a good negative. Every time he turns around like that, you're going to see a negative. You'll see it right there, negative. So mm-hmm. negatives is how we read the dog. Like, see, he's, he's giving me, hey, someone's in, maybe in this boat up high. He's gonna give me another negative. Negative comes back to the to the source. So I would never let him search this long for a suspect. Okay. I pretty much right right at the start of that video, I'd have been able to tell you where the suspect is that he's in the boat. This was an unknown search. Um, so you know he knows where he is. He's what's right what's he the doing there? Right there? Is, are you telling just, him to sit there? Yeah. Yeah. Just to tell him to sit. I don't want him. Uh, so with Nate, I don't want him animated. Uh, Nate is a silent alert dog. Uh, we sent him into a business 
and say suspects hiding in a closet. I don't want the dog to give away our position by barking and give away his position by barking. The mm-hmm. dog's going to remain silent. Uh, he will give me a silent alert just by either scratching, uh, showing interest, tail up, ears up, and looking at what his objective is. And I'll be able to, you know, I can tell in, in exactly where the suspect is based on his behaviors. So we're some dogs, a lot of guys train for, uh, you know, barking alerts where, hey, the dog finds a suspect, he barks, yap, 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 yap. And that's their alert as, hey, the suspect's right here. Nate mm. is more, we have to remain in visual eyesight of the dog and, uh, and, and watch his behavior and mannerisms because we, we want to be as quiet as possible. A lot of the guys, I would say the majority of the people we go after are armed. Um, and if the dog sits there and barks, you get shot through the door and give away the team's position that we're even there. So I want a silent, you know, silent dog that does his job and, and, and is able to locate the suspects. That's what you're seeing there. Wow, that's amazing. So, I mean, the same question I asked Cassidy a while ago, the training never really ends, right? I mean, he's pretty adept at his job right now, but just to get to the level where he can alert you in a silent manner, um, that's like another tier of training, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, so, I mean, not only that, but he, I mean, he's laser trained. Yeah, you know, I got a laser on the end of these guys' gun. You search, you know, I got six bill- six doors in front of me, and I want one search. They laser it, and he goes right to the door. I mean, you got, you know, I've used this tool right here. It's an e-collar. Uh, he's wearing an e-collar and there's a tone that it makes when I push the button, that tone gets him to come back to me like he just did. Uh, I don't have to say, Hey, Nate here, Nate here in a building and try to get him back. He could be six rooms deep and I want him back. And I hit that button and he comes right back to me or, uh, I can, you know, vibrate the, the collar and he downs wherever he is. So if I send him into a room and I need it guarded because it's an unknown, uh, and we've got to clear up to him. So I'll down him in the room with the, using the vibration function. And, you know, he stays there until somebody either pops out or we come get him. Um, wow. So there's a lot. I mean, th- these dogs, Nate has an immense amount of training in him. And there's things that, you know, a normal patrol dog wouldn't have, wouldn't necessarily need. Um, and But, yeah, you know, I guarantee you, a Bortac Yoda had a lot of this training. Wow. Um, Cassidy, to you. So, um Charlie is trained in search and rescue, but now you, you're going to train him in being able to search human remains. Um, what's the, how, how do you do that? How do you train to search remains like that? Well, um, you know, you need source for practice. Um, Charlie uses a lot of donated teeth. Um, <laughs> the, teeth, the, teeth, the, teeth <laughs> the teeth carry an odor. The uh, the I mean, for the dogs, they do, a, you yeah. know, a tiny, wow. tiny, tiny amount. And um, especially if uh, our dentist actually donates. Uh, so it's the tooth plus the root, a little bit of blood. Um, my basement is very weird. <laughs> so <laughs> all of us, you know, scent articles are stored safely in their own freezer and all that. Um, we also, you know, people donate items um and they really need just the tiniest 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 amount um of odor to train on because ideally if you you know you train charlie on a small amount of odor when he goes out to actually um help find um someone who is probably deceased you know that's a much larger amount of odor it'll be super easy for him uh, I don't know how to pronounce this game, but uh, what does canine mean? It obviously c- comes from the word canine, meaning dog. And where do these dogs go once they retire? How old are the dogs when they retire? You mentioned T-Rex, and uh, he's living with you now, T-Rex, right? Yeah, yeah so, I mean, it, it, it all goes – is based off of health. It's a, it's all based off of health. We've had a dog who was 13 uh, who was shot in the line of duty, and he lived – you know, he worked two years after he was shot. So, I mean, it just based on – how far we can get them uh, where they're in in good, healthy um, shape and able to do their job properly. Uh, Once we see that they're not able to do their job or we start seeing signs of aging and and issues come up uh, with workability, we'll usually retire the dog. The dog comes home with a handler. Uh, Every department's different. There's some departments that, you know, won't let the handler keep them, unfortunately. There's some, you know, it's just the reality we're in today and uh, it's sad. 
but um, we're blessed with uh, the East Police Department allows us to to keep our hand our, our canine and signs us, signs them over to us, and you know they live out the remainder of their life as a uh, big couch potato. And uh, Lex Luther has a, a great question: Are canines on the unit strictly male? Are there female working dogs? No, there's females as well. Uh, we don't have any currently. We have had one in the past, uh, and usually the reason why is most of our dogs are not uh, are, are not fixed; uh, they're intact. So, uh, as you can imagine, you get into a training environment where you're trying to keep the dog focused on, you know, doing his job and, and learning new techniques and, and refining. Um, to have a female present is is hard because as soon as if they can smell, you know, the tiniest of tiny things and you know find suspects hiding in, in wherever they're hidden you know you can imagine they can also smell that female dog so males being males you know will will get distracted uh so typically we 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 try to only get male dogs um that doesn't mean that if a jam up female dog comes along that we won't snag her up uh hope 46 sf what a great show joel coe and space coast uh, so creative that dogs and handlers on the show. So one of my favorites so far, Joel, bless you. The COE is on my case. It is, uh, we're, we're working a lot. Uh, if you guys can help support the show either through Patreon or, uh, becoming the YouTube member, that would help us a lot. If you can't support us that way, please go to the audio portion on Apple, Spotify, audible, and please give us uh, on Apple, uh, five stars that helps us uh, just as much, but, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, Officer Foster, Nugget, that is uh, Detective Phil Waters' dog. Uh, Nugget weighs about three pounds. It's a chihuahua that's a lazy ass, never wakes up during our show. Uh, Tali in Israel says, thinks Nugget was a canine in her past life. I can't make fun of Phil because Phil is the real Magnum P.I. Uh, speaking of this, by the way, um, even Officer Foster said, look, I might get called out. Uh, I'm on SWAT. Uh, if something goes down, I might have to run. We're on call 24 hours. So we were supposed to have Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly on uh, from Oregon. And this is radar. Uh, it was just COE and I are in sync. Uh, Officer Foster, take a look at this. Um, this is radar, the other dog. What kind of training is this? Obviously, it's bite training there. Um, they thought it would be funny once to put me in a suit when I was working in Tucson, Arizona on an Air Force base. And uh they had the dog bite my groin area. That was not a lot of fun. But what's going on here? What are they doing? Uh, it looked like they were just working on apprehension work, uh, probably like a small building search where you send the dog in on his own. Um, a lot of times we do this type, type of training with a handler will remain outside the building and we'll send the dog in. Builds like courage and, and, and just consistency with the dog. You're going you're gonna to send the dog in. They're going to become re less reliant on the handler, which you never want the dog to be too reliant on the handler. So it uh, looks like here they're just doing control work. Um, control work is where we're trying to cap the drive of the dog. So you have a dog that is in nature, wants to do what he wants to do. Um, and he, what he wants to do is play tug of war with that decoy. Uh, so you're, what you're trying to do, and the goal is for that is, hey, I'm going to tell you when to either engage that decoy or I'm going to tell you not to engage that decoy. And what he's doing here is reinforcing the, Hey, you didn't touch the decoy. Guess what? Ooh, good job. Here's is that what, is that what flies into frame right there? Yeah, that's, that's a toy. A call. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's and then call. we have one more radar here. If you can walk us through this, this is pretty wild. Um, Mission impossible. This is radar with his handler, Eamon O'Reilly. Yep. A skill we will probably never use, but it's, uh, you know, one we always train. Repelling. And what is scaling? Repelling. So you're just repelling. gonna repel with the dog, yeah. So the harness I actually have uh, is gonna be the same harness he's wearing right there. Uh, his is just, just in black. Uh, it's a repel certified harness. Uh, we'll work on different techniques to get the dog to lower the dog to the ground, either between your legs, behind your back. Uh, you know, just different ways to get him out of out of the out of the helicopter uh, if we have to move from point A to point B on a, on a bird. Um, so, you know, you always train for something you're probably never going to use. Um, this is one of those situations I don't think it's ever been used in the history of law enforcement, really. No, it probably has, but, you know, not anywhere I've ever heard. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good skill to have, uh, especially most, most likely you're going to be repelling out of a helicopter.
Uh, it's kind of what we train for the same same deal. What's up, O'Reilly? It looks badass. And there is a uh, Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing it correctly. He's a patrol sergeant with the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Hillsborough, Oregon. Uh, Sarge, were you guys just taking down a suspect or what? <laughs> no, no, just it, more mundane police duties. <laughs> I, most most of my job is pretty boring. <laughs> so meet um. Meet Officer Foster with the Houston Police Department. He's also a canine handler. His dog, his canine, is Nate. And then we've got Cassidy, who is training a search and rescue dog named Charlie. Uh, but since uh, you're here now, Sarge, is it pronounced Amen? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, sir. You got it right, Amen. So uh, tell us, how long have you been um, with Radar? And uh, what, what's Radar's primary um, you know, duty? Yeah, it's Raider's been my partner <clears throat> for coming up on nine years. Uh, he is an apprehension dog. So uh, his job is to locate uh, fresh fresh human scent. So he's a, he's a tracking. He's a tracking dog, basically. A tracking dog. And and how often, um, there's some video of him right there biting a leg. Yeah. By the way, Sergeant uh, O'Reilly, when, when you give the bite command, uh, does Radar – clamp down and doesn't release until you tell them to is that how it works that's that's basically the goal of of police canine work is to hold it's really to distract and to hold the suspect uh we're not we're not trying to do damage we're not trying to i mean it's going to cause injury but that's not the point uh the point is to hold the suspect so that the police can then come detain that person uh and it's 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 very distracting uh, to have a dog attached to you somewhere. My mine prefers legs. Uh, wasn't intentional. We didn't we didn't train it that way. That's just what uh, that's just what he developed a love for legs. But uh, yeah, so they, I mean, it's going to cause a little damage. But the whole point is that while the dog is biting someone, it gives the police the opportunity to move in and then uh, take control of that person. So uh, t typically, at, at I mean, one bite is is great uh sometimes it's two it's two bites but it's not uh, it's not two different places a lot of the times the dog will go in originally for its bite and it'll only get a frontal bite which is the, the front teeth the canine teeth and we're looking for that dog to rebite and so they're going to bite in the same place but a little deeper in the mouth that's going to help them help them control that limb or whatever they're biting and uh not tear as much as as much flesh the front the front teeth the canine teeth that's where most of the damage happens the, the rear teeth uh, are just going to hold on to that person and, until we can detain them and uh, officer foster when um nate bites down do you generally hear a, a yelp from the uh suspect do you, do you usually hear something you know it's, it's surprising i think the past uh two we've had were completely silent uh one being in a closet on a swat scene on a six-hour standoff uh sent him in and he engaged the suspect and um you know other than nate you know doing his job and and thrashing and holding on to the guy there was no sound from the suspect we had a similar one with a, a guy sitting on top of a rifle in a closet as well uh probably a couple days before that and a uh, similar situation uh sent him into the closet uh we lost eyes on the on the closet and didn't even know he was head main contact or, or was on anybody so sometimes you get that silent alert silent you know uh suspect and then other times you get the ones that are just you know it, it, they're calling for blood yelling and screaming and crying to mama um so it just it just depends um you know these dogs they 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 bite and hold and we train our dogs to bite whatever's available um if, if they see you know a hand they're gonna bite a hand if they see you know a foot they're gonna bite a foot you know they're gonna bite whatever whatever they see they come in contact with first um that's just the way we train ours um you know, Nate, he really, he could care less if he had a foot, an arm, a, a leg, a back. He did, it did, doesn't matter. It's, it's whatever he can get, grab a hold of and, and maintain, um, he's going to bite. Now, obviously, if the dog is, is impacted with something, you know, a weapon or a, or a hand, he's going to come off and probably go to whatever's hitting him and, and causing pain. Uh, so whether that be your hand or, or your foot, he's going to he's going to stop it from from attacking him. So. By the way, I'd be crying to my mama, who's right there. That is my mama uh, on this, the new set we've got here. And that is right there. I should ne can never be a weatherman. That is Mabel Rose. May she rest in peace. 17 years old. I had her before my wife, before my three kids. I love that dog. I was actually at the gym today. I brought my dog, not to make everyone depressed, but I was thinking about this at the gym. December 26th, I brought her to the vet. She was not doing well already. 
I left her for three hours and she died in natural causes when I was gone. And uh, I wanted to just beat myself up at the gym today uh, because of that. I wasn't there when she passed. But what is she? I called the vet the next day and I'm still there. She is. That's by the way, Black Widow says Eamon is an Irish name and means protector. These are my dogs. Uh, these are my tough, tough dogs. That's Ethel, who's with us now. Uh, her tongue does not fit in her mouth. Um, that is her constant resting face, tongue hanging out. Um, and that is the beloved Mabel Rose. I actually have a photo of Mabel Rose in a NASA astronaut uniform. And I said, would it be disrespectful to Officer Foster and Sergeant O'Reilly to bring in Mabel uh, in a NASA astronaut uniform being the American hero that she is. And my wife said that was a horrible idea. And that is why you are not seeing Mabel Rose in uh, the NASA uniform. Um, Sergeant O'Reilly. So uh, Officer Foster told us a story that was got us going at the beginning. Really sad story that um, Nate was actually stabbed back in 2022, almost died. He had training. Have you had a situation where radar has been hurt on the job? Uh, well, not not stabbed. He's been he's been kicked in the face. That's about the worst <clears throat> that he's that he's had from a suspect. He's been in a fight with other dogs. He's got more injuries from fighting with other dogs than he has than he has from people. But yeah, getting getting kicked in the face is about the worst that, that radars had to deal with at work. And how does um ra radar I take by the way, radar's right behind you in that little uh cage. I yeah, he's, he's he's back here. There, oh look at him. <laughs> and does he um does he go home with you every night? I mean, he stays with you, he, right? He does, yeah. Yeah, and how? I mean, how do you describe your relationship with him? Because, um, you know, earlier Officer Foster was saying, as horrible and awful as it is that Nate was stabbed, and obviously he survived, and and not only survived but came back to flourish on the job. That at the end of the day, you know, you have to put things in perspective, and it's it's hard to say this. It might be better to lose a dog, although I don't know if I completely believe this in a human being but you certainly don't want to lose um an officer but how do you i don't know how do you negotiate that in your own mind that at the end of the day he's really a working dog but you got to still love him to death right yeah actually the the love part came much later than when i joined the team than than understanding that he's a tool i've, I've understood that he's a tool since the very beginning um i wasn't really a dog person when I joined the team, I, I joined the team because I liked the interaction that the that the team had with their dogs. I liked watching them solve solve problems and solve puzzles with their dogs, and I, and I liked that, and I wanted to be a part of that. And so I thought, you know what, I could do that with one of these with one of these things with one of these animals. Uh, and so it's always been to me uh, an, an eventuality or a reality that, that he could get hurt and that he might uh, die working. But that's that's his job and that's his role. Uh, it came probably uh, a couple of years into having him that I actually started to really enjoy him and like him. And uh, it, it, we had to build that relationship. So I didn't I didn't even really I didn't care for him too much other than just a tool. Uh, for a couple of years but then since then I you know I said he's been my partner for nine years since then we've we've developed a relationship where you know he, he is my best friend now but it's not going to make me hesitate if I need to send him into a situation that's going to either save a citizen's life or save a co-worker's life uh, and that might be fatal to him that's still that's still his role and it's still his job right now Radar, close those ears. So you might get sent into the line of duty there. By the way, Vanilla Rose, love that name. My dog was Mabel Rose, just joined. OMG, it's Radar and O'Reilly. My day is made. Uh, Radar is quite the, uh, look at this. You know, I was just going to say this. Radar is a social media star. Radar has like 225,000 followers on Instagram. How did you build up that social media page? And I asked Officer Foster, what's up with his uh, his social media games far behind yours? But uh you know, but how, how did you build up this following? Uh, it, it was actually, I don't know. It was, it was fairly random. We just, we just hit the right algorithm a, a few months ago. I've, I've had the page for years and it's, you know, I had up to like, I think I had 2000 followers. Um, and which is, which is fine. Uh, I thought I was, I thought I was pretty big stuff with 2000 followers. Um, and then I randomly just shared some videos of me sharing my lunch with radar and sharing my snacks with radar. 
and it just it hit the right it hit the right crowd. Uh, a couple of videos went viral, and then uh, now we've got this huge following I can barely keep up with. <laughs> How often are you working on Instagram? Uh, we're, we're daily posters. Yeah, daily, daily, posters. daily posting, yeah. Well, Sergeant O'Reilly, you better give a shout out to STS, man, because we don't have nearly as many followers. We're like sixty-seven thousand almost. But um, all right. We, Please give us a shout out. Look at this. Ashley says, OMG, Ethel's tongue. I had a pug Otis, RIP, that always held his tongue out too. Looked like a piece of baloney. Um, Cassie, why do you think people love dogs so much? What is it? I mean, they're not assholes like people, right? <laughs> There's a sound bite of the day yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, dogs are genuine and they're just, you get what you get. And... They're great. I mean, what's not to love? <laughs> They're the best. Uh, by the way, yeah. Detective Phil Waters always goes on a tirade about because he loves his dog Nugget. He always says it's no coincidence that uh, dog is God spelled backwards. Uh, D. Maynard wants to know, how old is Radar, Sergeant O'Reilly? Uh, he will be 10 on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is his birthday, 10 years old. Wow. And uh, how long can he work for? Uh, I, you know what? Uh, just in my, in my experience looking at his ability to work right now he's probably got another year uh it's going to be up to whether or not he's able to do that we don't have we don't set a time limit on it as long as the dog is still able to do the job willing to do the job uh and and not going to be a wreck when we retire them uh then we'll let him we'll let him keep working uh he's got no no signs of slowing down right now he's actually more successful this year than than he's been uh, for most of his career. So we're, we're at a high point right now. Wow. And if right now, cause I was just asking officer Foster this, let's say you're called out right now, L lights and sirens go on. Does radars game face go on along with that? Excited. Yeah. Yeah. He's the, the, the dip the, with him though, as soon as we get somewhere and I let him out of the car, he's going to be back to just regular old goofy radar until I tell him again that it's time to work. So he, he he'll enjoy the ride and he'll get he'll get pretty excited, a little bit whiny, a little mouthy. Uh, but but once once we stop and get him out of the car, he forgets about the whole ride, wherever we're about the whole uh, the whole ride to wherever we're going. Someone just said, is radar famous or something? The answer to that is yes. Uh, do officers prefer uh, German Shepherds or Malinois? Uh, officer uh, Foster. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on the officer. Uh, I've, I've had the privilege of working both. I worked at Malinois first, and I went to a Shepherd, and then I'm back at a Malinois. Uh, and, you know, it, it really depends on the officer's speed, I guess, is what I, how I would put it. The differences between them would be is if you had a suspect behind a door, uh, and a German Shepherd walked up to that door and smelled the door, he's going to methodically usually try to find a, a, a way around or in that room. Um, a Malinois is just going to bust his head into the wall until he knocks it, knocks it a hole in it and gets a suspect. It's typically your, your typical Mal and Shepherd. Now there can be those Mal's with Shepherd brains and there could be those Shepherds with Mal brains. Um, not every dog's the same. Uh, so it, it just depends on the dog. But for me, I'm going to Mal all day long. Hmm. Um, so STS Nation uh, sent in a, a gazillion questions, which we're not going to have a time to get to all of them. But one of them is, do you prefer dogs to a human partner? Um, Officer Foster, uh, your uh, answer to that? Would you rather work with a human? You know, or, you know or if, my old, if my old partner ever, uh, if you ever heard <laughs> this, he'd probably kick me in the, in the butt. But no, uh, you know, it's just different. Uh, you know. It, it's it's kind of like we go to work and we're around our dog all day long. Really, no real conversation happening. It's different working with that human partner. You're you're sitting there chit chatting the entire time, talking about you know football and everything else, and uh, it's just different. Um, I would take a, a a canine working with a canine because of their capabilities over a human partner any day. Um, but you know, it, it's just it's two different worlds. Uh, if you, once you're in the canine world, it, you're not going back. Uh, Meezy mom says, O'Reilly, that's Sergeant O'Reilly to you. One said Malinois is French for don't get one of these. Um, probably a good thing to not have him bite you. Same question to you, Officer O'Reilly. You prefer working. You said you weren't much of a dog person beforehand, but do you now prefer working with a canine or with a human? Yeah, well, I wasn't much of a people person either. So, <laughs> but I like yeah, you. I, I like you. 
I, I would I would prefer uh, I would prefer working with the dog. We we don't have uh, partner cars at my agency. It's we're all if you're not working with a dog, you've got nothing in your car. So my option is a dog in the car or no one in the car. And I I I love having the dog in the car. Dog dogs are as a partner cut goes. Um, dogs are predictable. Uh, once you get to know him and once you get to know your partner, he's, he's predictable. So I know what to expect from him. And, and if I get tired of him, I, I can just put him back, you know, I put him back there and I close the door and I don't have to deal with him for a little while. So I'll, I'll take a dog any day. Mm. Uh, Jersey Jen Castaldi with a new photo question to the panel. What drew you officer Foster to want to be a canine officer? You sort of look at Charlie's getting, uh, by the way, Chewy has a huge billboard in Miami that says you don't let your human friends lick you on the face, which is true. You're kind of <laughs> disgusting, but you do let dogs lick you. Um, highest respect to the handlers and the canines. Uh, Officer Foster, so it was a choice, I guess, uh, at least in your department. So what made you make the decision to do it? You know, these these canines are capable of finding suspects that you never would have found otherwise. I was on numerous scenes with prior canine handlers back when I was working patrol for about eight years that these dogs will get to your scene and they find somebody that you're like, man, I never would have looked there. I never would have, never would have checked that. And so just seeing that over and over again and seeing the capabilities of the dog, it was like, ah, you know what, that's what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to work with, with one of those guys. Uh, and then it developed into, oh man, I want to be that SWAT canine handler on a tactical team. Um, and so it, it's just, it developed, uh, I developed into a love and, and a passion of mine and I just kind of, you know, rolled with it and I'll be doing it till, the day I leave the department. Uh, hopefully that is no, no time soon because they need you. Um, Officer O'Reilly here, Sergeant O'Reilly to me. Um, where did this question go? This is an interesting question. How do you and uh, radar and the other canines coordinate with, you know, your fellow officers. And if you have, you know, in other jurisdiction coming on scene, they don't all know how to react to a dog necessarily. So, uh, how do they, um, you know, kind of coordinate all that and, uh, intersect with one another yeah so for us we depending on whether or not we know the officers that we're going to be working with uh we'll, we'll give a little brief we'll give a, a little example or a, an explanation of what to expect from us and what to expect from the dog based on the call so you know if we're doing a track we do a lot of tracking up here we do some building searches radar's pretty good at building search but we do a lot of tracking and, and you typically have one or two cover officers running with me. And I'm just going to give them a little, I'm going to give them a little heads up. I'm going to say, this is, this is what radar is going to do. I'm going to let you know if we're getting near a suspect, if we get near a suspect, I'm going to transfer control commands over to you for the suspect. This is what will happen if he's biting someone. This is what I'm going to need from you. And so I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll give a little brief before we get started so that the officers know what, what to expect from us uh, during the search and, and once the search is done. Hmm. Uh, Chelsea Whitaker, all fired up because uh, before you got on, Sergeant O'Reilly, I asked uh, Officer Foster uh, what happened to the suspect that stabbed Nate. And they said it can't be charged for attempted murder on an officer. The laws don't allow Did the laws. What are the laws like in Oregon? It's the same here. Uh, it's just a dog. Uh, there's no there's no enhancement for radar. He's he's technically deputized, but. Uh, it doesn't make him an officer. It was really more of uh, a ceremony. Uh, uh, it's, so he's, he's te technically he's, he's just a dog. So uh, we can't, I can't protect him like I would be able to protect a person. And if he gets hurt, then it's just the same as, as someone hurting a, a neighbor pet. Mm. Uh, so Chelsea Whitaker says, Joel, please ask how we can help change the laws in Texas and Oregon for canines hurt on the job. STS nation wants to help. Is there anything officer Foster that the public can do to call their uh, lawmakers and say, Hey, treat these canines like human beings. Yeah. Just that contact your representatives, you know, contact the lawmakers and reach out and, and express your concerns with that. Um, I will tell you in, in my circumstance, the, uh, the suspect that stabbed Nate got out of jail the next day uh, and <laughs> killed his father and he will, will be serving probably a life sentence. So he will not be getting out of jail anytime soon. But I mean, as you can imagine, you just stabbed a police dog. You got out the next day on a bond, and uh, we're able to do something, you know, like kill another human being. Um, there's an issue. Father. Yeah. So, oh, and, and you know, there's there's an issue there. So, yeah, absolutely. Reach out to your, your state representative, uh, your congressman and, and, and push the issue. I mean, we you know, the squeaky wheel gets the, you know, gets the grease. So. 
Uh, by the way, present here says loving. Someone says loving Charlie. Then this person says dogs are smarter than some people. I would have to say most people. Um, Sergeant O'Reilly, uh, to you, how old does a dog need to be before uh, it begins its work uh, on a police force? Uh, p- people can start training them really young. It, it depends. Uh, some agencies raise their, raise their own dogs and train their own dogs for puppies. We don't. We we go to kennels and and we typically buy. We test and buy dogs between uh, generally 18 to 24 months is about the ages we get. I got Ritter at one. Uh, he was 12 months old, uh, which is pretty young for a police dog uh, to start police work. He was a little bit immature and and difficult to handle at, at 12 months. But um, 18 to 24, if, for our agency, the way we do it, and typically in the Pacific Northwest, uh, 18 to 24 months is is when we get access to to purchasing dogs for for training for police work yeah, and ours is a little different ours so i mean we it's hard to get a dog at 18 months usually they're all the good ones are taken up so we're usually buying our dogs around 10 months um and and having to train that puppy out of them um you know in a quick manner so it it really depends on who's selling them what's available because we're we're in a market that you know we're we're, we're fighting against the the you know, Department of Justice and, and Department of Defense to get these dogs. And, you know, they're buying all the, the military dogs pretty quickly. And so most of the good dogs are, you know, that we're looking at are probably pre- pretty taken. So unless we get them young from these kennels, then we're, you know, we're probably stuck with the, the secondhand dogs. Hmm. Um, let's go around the horn on this one. And I know these guys' time uh, are all very valuable. So we'll start to wrap in a little bit. Um, Aloha 808. How are their names chosen? How did you pick Charlie Cassidy for, for your pup's name? Uh, Charlie, I named after um, all dogs go to heaven, of course. <laughs> I don't know. I just picked it. I had no idea that he would be doing search and rescue and a cadaver dog when I got him. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and back to the um, now you're going to have him um, certified for human remains. Um, mm-hmm. I can you use an animal's remains to train a dog for human remains? You can't. No, absolutely okay. not. Um, okay. I ask actually... questions sometimes. Oh, no, no. That's, I mean, that's a valid question. It's, you know, um, there he's actually tested against, against those things to make sure that he's not out there and, you know, alerting on a dead deer or a dead bird or whatever. Mm. Um, just strictly human remains. Okay. And Sergeant O'Reilly, how'd we get radar? Uh, I think I'm funny. Uh, and radar was named after the MASH character. That's uh, what I was Corporal hoping for. Walter. Yeah. Corporal Walter Eugene Radar O'Reilly. <laughs> Are you a fan of the show? Is that why? I am. I am a, <laughs> I am a pretty big fan. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great show. And how'd we get Nate? Officer Foster. It's a name that was given to him overseas. Uh, you know, just kind of, I'm not changing it. He knew he responded to it. Well, uh, typically if we're going to change our dog's name here, um, T-Rex's name was Tehran. Um, and I wasn't about to yell out a name that, you know, I can't pronounce <laughs> half the time, uh, especially in a, in a, in a busy circumstance, like a police scene. So, uh, you know, it, it just, it, you usually train it. We trans. You know, if it starts with a T, sounds like we're using a T syllable, then we're going to transfer it to something like T-Rex where the same syllables there, it's easy to retrain on. Uh, but Nate just came came with Nate, and I, I tell people all the time, and it was after Nate Dog, but every you know the young kids all look at me like, who's Nate Dog? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big Nate Diaz fan, UFC fan. Uh, okay. I like that. Um, Burning Queen, uh, close your – ears dogs for a minute please close your ears well the canines uh sergeant o'reilly have a line of duty death funeral god forbid uh they succumb to injuries uh would they have uh a proper line of death funeral uh we would have to we would have to come up with something we'd have to create something because we it's it's never happened here since i've been at the agency and since i've been in the in the area we haven't had one so we don't have a uh yeah we don't we don't have any protocol i'd have to i'd have to write something um officer foster how spoiled are they at home i see uh nate looks like a good boy he's just playing with his toy back there you know so nate is not an inside dog uh i've got a, a 12 by 12 kennel in the backyard when he comes home he goes into his kennel uh he is a working dog he's totally different than a house dog um it, you know you you tend to start spo- spoiling these dogs you start seeing habits at work 
uh, start forming. And um, so it, when he is is at home, he is in his kennel. He'll get breaks and he'll get ball play and we'll do a little bit of maybe training and obedience during the day, but that's it. Um, I'll feed him uh, twice a day, once before we leave and then once when I come home. And other than that, he's just – he's out there and he prefers it. You know, uh, I, I can open up the door and he's right back to his kennel and he, he doesn't even care. He's like, I don't want to be in the house. So you never sneak him into bed at night? It's not allowed? No, 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 no. He wouldn't be a good – a comfy sleeper, man. He's like <laughs> – he, 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 he's a Malinois. They, they do not make good pets. Uh, you know, T-Rex, when he acclimated to the house, he was chewing holes in my doors, chewing holes in the walls. Uh, he's broken probably six of my wife's lamps. Uh, he's broken a TV set. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, these dogs are not home dogs. They, they do not belong in the house. Um, and, you know, he, if, if I had two kennels, T-Rex would be out there too, and he'd be just as happy. So it, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where they have to, you know, you have to adapt them to that home life once they retire. Um, but, you know, it, and it may sound cruel, but, you know, that's what he prefers. He prefers two places, his kennel at home and his kennel in the back of the car, and that's where he loves yeah. And uh, Officer Foster, I, I've seen videos of these Malinois. Their vertical leap is insane. They can like walk on a tightrope. Have you ever have you ever measured the vertical leap? Uh, so T Rex's was he, he was he stands waist high uh, when he had four legs. Uh, his back, he's he's a 110 pound Malinois, um, and his vertical leap, he could clear a six foot fence without touching it. Uh, I've got pictures of him on Instagram where he's I've got my ball above my head and his waist line is probably right at eye level um so he, he clearly jumped about nine feet in the air just out of, off a standing jump uh nate can do uh one paw pass on a fence so he'll he can run up to a six foot fence and, and actually clear it with just touching it once with his front feet um so it just you know these mouths it just depends on the dog too every dog's different some dogs are athletes some dogs aren't um but yeah i mean malinois are extremely they're like you know the freak athletes of the of the canine world mm. Uh, Rachel Fraker, uh, to you, Sergeant O'Reilly, are Labradors ever police dogs? Uh, people love labs. Can they be used in the, you know, as a canine officer? Yeah, it just depends on the discipline. Uh, labs can make fantastic, uh, detection dogs or drug dogs or explosive detection dogs. The, the, the three basic disciplines for law enforcement, the apprehension, drug detection and explosive detection, and the apprehension is the only one we really need a dog that's able to be scary and, and bite people. The other ones, we call them floppy ear. The floppy ear dogs, they're perfect for, they can be perfect drug dogs and explosive detection dogs. Mm. And, and Sergeant O'Reilly, something that we've been talking about, and I promise we're going to wrap up in a minute. By the way, shout out to D Maynard supporting us, supporting us, becoming a YouTube member. Need that support, Patreon, YouTube member. If you can't do that, please give us five stars uh, at Apple uh, on the audio side. That would help us. Uh, it goes a long way. Um, fentanyl. We were just talking about this the other day, and I can't even remember um, the exact uh, context, but it's a real problem uh, on the streets. How 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 big of an issue has it become in your part of Oregon? Um, and can dogs help in any way in terms of detecting it? Yeah, uh, it's it's killing a lot of people here. A lot of people. Uh, every just about every street drug you can get your hands on is laced with it. Uh, and there's no uh, it's it, it's a fantastic drug for hospitals where they can regulate it. But the guys that are making the street drugs, they can't regulate it. And it doesn't take very much to kill you. So it's killing a lot of people. And our we have one. My agency has one detection dog. Uh, dog's name is Mando. And Mando a few months ago got certified on detecting fentanyl. And so now he's a, he's a four odor dog now, which is uh, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. And he works pretty directly, pretty close. He's actually on our uh, drug task force and, and they're finding, they're finding loads of fentanyl. And uh, we're just about to start uh, a program, looking into starting a program for getting a drug dog inside of our jail. Cause we're finding, we're finding tons of it in the jail too. So yeah, dogs absolutely going to be crucial in 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 fighting the fentanyl the fentanyl scene yeah officer foster same question how bad is fentanyl on the streets of houston right now you know i luckily i do not have to do with anything narcotics uh we have our own narcotics division that maintains their i think they have probably 10 plus dogs uh, you know so thank god i don't have to mess with that stuff uh we do come across it on swat scenes where you know we're doing uh, narcotic search warrants 
Um, and, it, and it's very, you know, it's an issue we're seeing more and more of. Um, and obviously it's an extremely dangerous, um, like Sergeant O'Reilly was saying. I mean, it's just, you know, a little bit can, can wipe out a good amount of people. By the way, uh, another show tonight, there sure is. We're doing the Dan Markell murder case. Charlie Adelson is about to go to trial. I'm going to CrimeCon tomorrow, so we're doing another show, 7 p.m. Before I forget, tomorrow, uh, since we're on the road to CrimeCon in Orlando, we're re-airing, speaking of dogs, this has to do with tigers. We had Carol Baskin from Tiger King on, and you'll hear why she called my mom an endangered species. Uh, we're going to release that episode uh, tomorrow. T-Pain says, Joel needs some coffee. I'll be all right. Um, final question or two, uh, back to you, Sergeant O'Reilly, how many days off does radar get and what does he do on his downtime? Does he read the paper or what? <laughs> uh, much like officer Foster, my radar spends most of his time outdoors. He, he's an outdoor dog. He lives in a kennel outside, but he's got access to my yard. Uh, and he spends a little, he spends a lot of time running around the yard, terrorizing uh, the chickens. Uh, I love to run. He, he runs a lot with me uh, and uh, we don't, we don't do dog parks and, and, but we'll do some neighborhood walks now and then, but uh, yeah, he's, he's, he, as far as Malinois go, he's, uh, he's a relatively chill uh, Malinois, but definitely not allowed in my house. God. <laughs> poor, poor radar. Uh, so those who uh, tuned in a little bit late, you're looking at Charlie with Cassie there. He is a four-year-old German shepherd from Kansas city, Kansas. He's a certified live find search and rescue dog. Uh, with the National Association of Search and Rescue. That's uh, who he's certified through. And he's going to be obtaining his second certification for human remains. Uh, when is that going to happen, uh, Cassidy? And your final thoughts on these beautiful creatures? Uh, January, he will be getting his certification from Napawada. Uh, we're really excited. And my final thoughts on these guys is that your, your guys' dogs are just badass. And thank you for everything that you do. It's amazing. And uh, you echo our sentiments as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, he came on late. We're going to get him back on one of these days. Next time there's a fugitive manhunt and a guy like Yoda captures the uh, suspect. We'll bring Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly back on. He is a patrol sergeant with the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Hillsborough, Oregon. Uh, when he's not working, he's signing autographs because him and Radar have like 225,000 uh, Instagram followers. And uh, Officer Foster is... Uh, Slightly jealous, but he's going to pick up his Insta game now. They'll talk offline. I'll send them a link. I'll connect them via email, and uh, they'll help each other bring up that uh, hey. Insta game because I don't want Officer Foster getting uh, – I don't want the other officers making fun of you, Officer Foster. Hey, I, I don't have the time for it, honestly. I'm too busy <laughs> out there running running spot scenes and running patrol calls, man. We're, it's hard enough. I, I t Kudos to you because, man, social media is not an easy thing to do. Yeah, take it from me. It's not. It's a lot of work to do this stuff. But – um. Sergeant O'Reilly, your final thoughts today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, how important is uh, radar to you, and how important is our our, our canines in general to uh, law enforcement? I, I think they're they're absolutely instrumental to to law enforcement. I I, I can't imagine uh, the success that we have in as a, as an agency without without having police dogs. Uh, I. I and I'm, I'm eventually not going to have one. We're a one and done agency, which Officer Foster would think is bananas. Most people find out that we're we're a one dog agency. So radar's all I get. Uh, so uh, he's he's been the best part of my career, uh, and I do it all over again just for this amount of time that I've spent with them. But yeah, they're absolutely integral to uh, to law enforcement. Does that mean that once he's retired, they're not getting you another dog? Is that what you're saying? That is correct. We need to we need to write to the chief there and let him know what we think about that. By the way, before we go, we got to show this video again with the Mission Impossible music. This is Radar in action. This guy's 50, 61,000 likes fun. on this. Yeah, just something I've always wanted to do as a member of the canine or as a member of the SWAT team to, to repel with my dog. So that's not a, easy. Once once in a lifetime experience, I think. How often do you train that? Is this just a sort of a once, once in a while kind of thing, or what? So for uh, us, train once we, a year. yeah, we train repelling and once a year, but this is the first time I've ever done it with radar. And uh, Officer Foster, you were saying you guys train once a week. Is that what you're saying? 
once a year for uh, for repelling. We, 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 you'll hit all of your areas, uh, whether it's large venue, small venue, um, you know, repelling things, you know, d deploying out of a helicopter. All that will be done on, on its own training schedule uh, each month. And so during those 12 months, every for us, a week long is tra is dedicated to, to that SWAT training. Um, so, I mean, you could be do you're going to definitely do repelling one month out of the year. Um, you're going to definitely do uh, helicopter deployments one month out of the year, um, fast roping, same thing. And well, climbing that, that, that ladder that he just did with a dog attached to you, that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, not at all. That, that doesn't I'm look sure his easy. dog weighs like 70 pounds too. So that's, <laughs> yeah. it's not doesn't, easy. Doesn't look easy. Donna Douglas. Um, this is to you, Sergeant O'Reilly. I promised you we're wrapping here. Do canines ever apprehend, for example, a drug dealer's dog? I remember one of you guys saying that. I think it was you, Sergeant O'Reilly, saying that your dogs got into more fights with other dogs than humans. Uh, what goes on when they come up uh, against a, a bad dog? Yeah, so yeah, Radar particularly doesn't care about other dogs. He's been in dog fights just because the other dogs wanted to fight. And it's, all, and it's, been, it's always been other police dogs. It's never been a citizen's dog. It's been it's been another handler who wasn't being very careful and let their dog out while there was another dog out. So they've all been accidents. Raiders never uh, Raiders never attacked a citizen's dog. He he just doesn't care. Hmm. Sergeant Foster, uh, he is a 16 year veteran of the Houston Police Department. He's been a handler in the Houston Police Department canine detail since 2014. I asked Phil Waters. If you could help me, and within three seconds of hearing that Phil Waters was making the request, we got uh, Officer Paul Foster. So thank you so much to Officer Foster. And, of course, his partner is Nate. Uh, it is his second SWAT patrol canine since becoming a handler. His first one was T-Rex. Bottom line question, what, is, uh, what did Nate and T-Rex mean to you, and how important are they uh, to the job that you do? I mean, they're like I said earlier, they're an invaluable asset to, uh, to our community. Uh, they're finding people that we never would have found otherwise. Um, I mean, we found people in dry roll, you know, like crawl down the wall in, in, into houses. We found people, you know, that you just never would have found. Yeah, I mean, I've tracked with Nate. I've tracked over a mile and located suspects hiding in the woods. So these dogs are, are definitely an invaluable asset to our, you know, especially for the, the safety of our community and the safety of our officers. Uh, the, the day, like I said, the day Nate was stabbed, he, he saved another officer's life. And uh, without his actions that day, that officer probably wouldn't be with us still. So, um, you know, there, you really, you know, you develop a, a personal bond with them, but at the end of the day, these guys are just amazing at what they do and they absolutely live for it. It's a, it is amazing. And what else is amazing last night, believe it or not, we had uh, three former inmates on and uh, Larry Levine, uh, when he comes on the show, the guy was dropping F bombs. It was insane. He also waved a plastic hatchet for some reason. So today YouTube flagged me for uh, excessive foul language waving a weapon and also encouraging crime because uh, Larry Levine was encouraging criminals to escape. Uh, the following day, I've got uh, canine uh, officers as well as their handlers. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a turnaround in 24 hours. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly, uh, Officer Paul Foster, and of course, Cassie, thank you to you. You guys do amazing work. I'd love to have you guys back. Remember, in... Uh, 19 minutes. We're doing another show on Charlie Adelson's trial coming up. Until then, 19 minutes from now. Love you, America. Love you, Houston. Love you, Kansas City. Love you, Oregon. And uh, the great state, country of America. And uh, everywhere near and far between. Uh, Till next time. Guys, hang out one second as I click off here.